Good everyone. Welcome to Baria 2 to listen to Ivan Gulenko, who will talk about uh, how to make um, IT recruiting suckless. We'll have a talk of about uh, 25, 30 minutes, and then we'll be able to, to share, uh, to ask questions, and uh, have a, this, uh, a discussion about what we have heard. So, please. Cool. So, hi guys. Um, the goal of this talk is essentially to um, give some of you who are hiring managers a chance to get inspiration how, how to improve uh, IT recruiting in your company. And for you who are more candidates, maybe job seekers, how to tailor your profile in a way that companies will not overlook you. So let's, let's see. Um, so I'm an engineer and people ask me, why, why would you do recruiting? Why do you do this job that is often, well, um, done by people who are non-technical, who just match keywords? And well, um, the reason is that there's many things to do just because of that. And there are a couple of companies that are doing already a very good job um, higher than Honeypot are trying to reverse the process so to make companies apply for engineers. There is Starfighter.io. Essentially, um, they are teaching engineers how the stock market works and how to write software in this space. It's done by Patrick McKinsey, who is sort of famous on Hacker News. Also, there is interviewing I.O. by Eileen Lerner, who is a, like, a computer science MIT graduate that has been doing technical recruiting for a couple of years in the Bay Area. And now she has a platform where Bay Area companies are matched with engineers. And it's all about code. So they have sort of a coder pad, and they do algorithmic challenges, uh, challenges on data structure, and they've even went so far that they would anonymize the voice. So it's not possible to see if it's a woman or a man interviewing. Also, there's Workshape.io from London. They essentially had the idea, well, let's um, ask the engineers what you want to do in your next job. And in this case, somebody said, OK, I want to do front end and UI, UX. And the company says they look for it like UI UX person, and then there is like a shape, and is matched like over each other, so you can see clearly um, the interests of the engineer and the interest of the company. So this is how matching is done by Workshape.io, a very cool company. Then there is Triple Byte, Silicon Valley based Y Combinator startup that recruits for other Y Combinator startups. So they essentially tell you, well, if you interview with us, you will skip all the steps and right, jump right to the final interview at Dropbox or, well, Airbnb or whatever. And this is definitely a super attractive offer for engineers because in my experience as a recruiter, I noticed that after five interviews, there's a interview fatigue. So you're like tired. You don't want to interview like anymore. So this company gives the value add that you kind of skip uh, steps, which is pretty cool. My motivation is that I believe that hiring is even more important in Europe because in Europe it's less of a hire and fire mentality like in the US. So here if you hire somebody, you really stick with the person. And um, it's the most important aspect in my opinion to have cool coworkers because I mean, no matter how cool the project or product is that you work uh, on, at some point you'll be bored in a way, and the only thing that, in my experience, kept me going as an engineer were the co-workers, my boss, and the people I would hang, well, spend more time with than with my spouse and stuff like that. So that's like something to keep in mind, and I would really um, urge that you get involved with the recruiting and hiring process in your company, no matter if you're a hiring manager or a candidate. Don't let HR screw up like the job ads and. Um, take part in, uh, in the recruiting processes in your company. A Google recruiter once told me that at Google, A players hire A players or A plus players, 
whereas at normal companies, B players hire B minus or C players. So <laughs> please, well, don't do that, because I believe it's kind of true at some companies, and I um, would really like to see that you invest a lot of effort in uh, to get your recruiting processes right. However, um, I would not recommend to copy the recruiting process of Google and ask to, um, well, spin, well, not like, uh, you, you know, transfer red-black trees into binary trees where the prime numbers are divisible by three or something like that. Because the big companies, they can ask those questions because they have a revolving door of candidates because of the big brand. Anyway, engineers will come to them and they have like many, many resumes, resumes to look at. So they have kind of a prestige being such a big brand, which your company probably does not have yet. But don't be disappointed because prestige is just fossilized inspiration. If you do anything well enough, you'll make it prestigious. But up until you are at this point, you have to make your processes in recruiting in a way that are attractive to um, engineers. So show what you have. You ha don't have a big brand name, but you maybe have a cool technology stack. Great opportunity to contribute. So especially junior engineers will love if you tell them, well, we need an API that does this and that. Please, in this internship in three months, you're going to build this for us. This is, in my experience, the only way to get like Google quality interns in your um, no brand company. If you give them like a big uh, chunk to work on. And reply fast to inquiries. So uh, I just talked yesterday to an engineer and he said, well, he interviewed with like two companies and the second one answered like in two minutes and he stopped sending resumes to others. So um, <laughs> as a hiring manager, I would really urge to do this as quick as possible to reply and uh, get back to people. At this conference, I saw one especially good example, Binder. They have two posters, and on the right poster, you see uh, exactly the technology stack very clearly, and on the left, you see, do you have what it takes to influence our product? So they communicate, okay, you're gonna have cool technology stack and you can contribute. You don't see anything really about the product and what they're doing, whereas on the other posters, if you go outside, you have lots of you know, more marketing-oriented um, material, which was clearly not designed for this conference, where this poster is clearly uh, recruiting material. So um, if you get into the effort to really look at what you want and which kind of engineers you think uh, you want to attract, there is a list of programmer types uh, done by triplebyte.com. This is uh, based on 10,000 matches that they have done. So they matched engineers with companies, and then they looked at what are the differences. And you get some kind of profiles that some of you might recognize yourself in. For instance, there is the academic programmer. So those are candidates who have spent most of their career in academia, programming as part of their master research, they have very high raw intellect and can use it to solve hard uh, programming problems. So this kind of guys, I usually ask if they can explain what a Git rebase is to see if they ever have collaborated like with others and not just wrote scripts to, well, bang out some uh, research thingy and then publish the paper. So there's experienced rusty programmer. So those are candidates who have lots of experience and can talk in depth about different tech stacks, databases, explaining their positive and negatives with detail. When programming during an interview, they're a bit rusty. They usually get to the right place, but it takes a while. So this is a place where probably all of us will end up in, because we are, well, most, some of us are young programmers, some are older, but at one point we'll be there. And I see, um, especially at smaller and middle-sized companies, a pr problem to really um, have people who are like over 50 to keep in the company and like to, to give them an opportunity to continue growing. But uh, I'll, I'll get back to that later. Um, trial and error programmer. So candidates who write code quickly and cleanly, their approach seems to involve a lot of trial and error, however. They dive straight into programming and seem a little ad hoc, but their speed enables them to ultimately solve the problems productively. So this might be um, early stage companies um, that have no processes in place and they need people to bang out code like really quickly. 
practical programmer. Candidates solve practical tasks uh, with ease, even very abstract programs. They aren't comfortable with CS terminology uh, and have a deep understanding of how and don't have a deep understanding how computers work. They are not comfortable with stuff like C. So this might be engineers who work like for web agencies. Child prodigy programmer. Candidate is very young, 19 years old, and decided to go straight into work, skipping college. They have been programming since a very young age, and they are very impressive in their ability to solve hard uh, problems. They've also been prolific with side projects and are mature for their age. It's likely they'll found a company in the future. Product programmer. Candidates perform very well on tech interviews will have, uh, and will have the respect of other engineers. They're not motivated by solving tech problems, however. They want to think about um, the product, talk to customers, and have an input into how product uh, decisions are made. So they're like more oriented towards the customer um, and um, th those UI, UX um, issues. Technical programmer. Candidates are the inverse of product programmers. They interview well and communicate clearly, but they aren't motivated to think about the UX or product decisions. They want to sink their teeth in hard technical problems. So the thing we saw with Binder is essentially something that is, um, like communicates more to a technical programmer rather than a product-oriented programmer. And those roles that we saw, well, uh, Triple Byte, in their very, very huge study, I mean, 10,000 resumes is really like a lot, they found out that like product programmers, at least in Silicon Valley, they are, the, well, companies, companies like them most, whereas the academic programmer is kind of a bit ignored. I'm not sure if this applies completely to Europe, because we are talking here about Bay Area startups, and uh, in Europe, the demand is a bit different. And I'm thinking if it's worth maybe to do a similar study in Europe with companies that are more, uh, let's say, normal. Yeah. So where to get engineers? So there are a couple of ways. So if you're like a company that doesn't have a big brand name, I'll recommend to have, for instance, a blog about technologies or about the IT in your city. So I, for instance, when I moved to Zurich, the first t uh, thing I did um, I, I wrote a blog post about like eight reasons why I moved to Switzerland to work in IT, and this was like almost two years ago, and I still got emails from people who are like, hey, I want to move to Zurich, uh, introduce me to a great company. So this, is, this blog post was the reason why, well, I could start my recruiting company quite quickly. So if you're a company in where, wherever, I'd recommend to, well, invest into a, a sort of an online presence about technology. Of course, meetups and attending meetups with a T-shirt with your company or organizing meetups is even better. It's an obvious way to get like people interested in your company and um, make this uh, sourcing problem easier. So, like, I mean, the problem most people, most companies have is they don't have enough applicants. So you have to do as much as you can to solve this. Um, employee referrals are underrated, in my opinion. So companies should pay or incentivize somehow if somebody brings in great people. So this was what Google does. So if you join Google, the first thing they do is like they force you to spam your classmates or stuff like that. Uh, at least, yep. This is what I heard from some people. Um, GitHub is an obvious uh, way also to get engineers. So if, you, if you're like using uh, Flask a lot, then it would be great to you know, um, just look at the, at the people who contribute there and get them on board. This is a bit the problem of like location. So you can do like queries like this um, to solve it a little bit. So you can use like the API to uh, query for uh, locate. So in the get request, I'm not sure if you can see it from the back. It's like API GitHub search users location Bilbao language Python, and um, um, then you get the engineers who are like in Bilbao uh, that do Python. So and then don't be evil. Don't spam them. Rather look at their blog and if you send a cold mail, try to make it personalized and interesting for them to read it. Um, so like as a side project, I did um, like uh, it's uh, the result of a hackathon, but we built like a web interface to actually do this. So like you go like, I don't know, JavaScript, like the wow. And then you go, yeah, find engineers. And you click. And then, then you get like uh, what you saw before, but like nicely displayed. And then, uh, yeah, you can, I mean, look up what, what the people did before and stuff like that. Yep. 
So and that's my like side project. I call it like gitrecruit.io, and um, I try to crack the combination between like automation and manual work in uh, uh, recruiting. So right now I'm have um, lots of manual work in Zurich, and I start to do it in Munich, and uh, we just build um, more and more uh, so, like tools in Python to well automate um, the scraping of the API and do cool stuff with that again without trying to be evil. Yep. So if you contact the people, um, it would be great um, like, to learn how to reach out. Um, a great example of that, I just um, uh, looked up on my uh, hard drive and anonymized it quickly. <laughs> so that's a very, very, very cool company. And they um, sent uh, cold mails. And this cold mail, it's like not short. So it's rather long. Uh, if you look at it, so it's like, um, so I'm the co-founder uh, and engineer like you. So you try like first line to, to get in touch and to, well, we are the same. So we're not a spammy LinkedIn recruiter who just, well, spams 10,000 people. But rather um, you say, well, why I like you. So you try to make this part like personalized. And here it's rather semi-personalized. I would say it's like, hey, I came across your website. And based on your experience, I think you could be a great fit for us. So that's a bit lame. Uh, <laughs> when, when I do these mails, I try to really look at the blog. And if like, somebody has a blog entry about Lambda expressions in Java 1.8, I try to tell them, OK, look, this company also uses Java 1.8. And also, well, you care about this and um, would be maybe a great fit. Um, so it's a bit less lame. The first line should be some, somehow, I mean, meaningful. And then you tell, I mean, what your company does and what the candidate can do for, uh, for you. And this mail, this company really, the whole mail is actually pretty good. Um, and they developed it with the CTO, CEO, and showed it like to 30 people, A-B tested it. And then they made a student uh, send out those emails to scale it, in a way. Yep, that, that was pretty efficient, I believe. Yeah, and then what you do, so you have the, uh, the candidate and you probably want to get to know them. So do a phone interview. So in a phone interview, the goal is like to really find out if the candidate cannot do anything. So you ask questions that are like everybody should be able to answer, like the famous FizzBuzz coding challenge where you just print the numbers 1 to 100 and divide them by 3, divide them by 5. Uh, so like easy stuff to like get rid of the people who, who obviously cannot do anything. This would be important and efficient. And then maybe you give a homework assignment, which shouldn't be like 10 days, um, but rather maybe two hours or three hours. And this you can use to, um, at, at the on-site, uh, talk about the homework. Uh, and also on top of that, give them maybe small um, coding assignments that you can do in pair programming uh, to see if the person fits into the company in the way they work. So um, I generally see the most uh, successful companies in recruiting, they try to spend with the candidate as much time as they can. So as a candidate, what can you do? I mean, obvious way is to have a resume that kind of re resonates with the community. So um, people, however, read resumes on autopilot. It's really, I mean, I think the average spent by HR people and even hiring managers is maybe less than a minute. So it would be great to uh, make it really short. So like a page per decade, I would say, is um, something that is reasonable. And contribution is more important than tech and framework. So like show how you contributed to the product, to the company or to the project. It's rather more important than if you use like this or that framework. However, <laughs> there is uh, the problem with HR. So if there is a bigger company and if there is HR involved, you always will get the problem that you have to go through this filter first. And then you have to obviously um, mention some frameworks such that they forward your CV to hiring managers. The worst case I experienced is when like a great engineer doesn't get forwarded to the hiring manager just because the keywords are missing. Like that's really, really terrible and should not happen at all. Um, so let's look at uh, a couple of chunks of text, and let's decide together if it's like good or bad. So like, um, first one would be 
like this is like in the resume the part where you talk about what you did, right? So design software application including data modeling, software architecture design, software hardware integration, user interface design, and database management. Created and launched a service that collects product opinions and recommendations from Twitter. The service finds related tweets, removes spam, analyzes sentiment, and creates a structured database of everything that was said about a particular product. Mm -hmm. The service is exposed as a consumer website and as widgets that can be embedded in online retail websites. Developed product name using Python and Django for marketing and allowing end users to experience blah. Evaluated and identified um, some operation system network stack, performance bottleneck in latency per uh, packet process overhead, and scalability of different network I.O. models through various system measurement and profiling techniques. So which one do you like best? Three, four? Two. Yeah, so the gentleman said, so it depends who's reading this. So um, the one is like number two is more for CTO and like number one is more for business people. Yeah, I mean, that's obviously right. Um, so I would also like prefer to the most because you literally can, ex well, from this short sort of short text, you can see what happened and what the person did. And of number four is my like second favorite. And one and three is literally I can, like especially one I can like I, I don't get like there's no like information in this so like zero entropy. I don't know. Um, so I don't get um, really an understanding what the person did in number one, right? Although you're right, like if you have the HR filter then the HR person literally might like one more. This is why recruiting is hard, right? Because <laughs> one, you don't see the business value of it. You see that the person did something, they burned some time, but you don't see the result. So from number one, you don't see the result and you don't see the business value. I would, no, like, I would agree, yes. So um, it's an interesting thing to, I mean, the best thing is just you show to other people, but probably you do this anyway to other IT people and then um, you can improve. So like this, this might be like totally trivial that you, I say avoid typos, but there is actually data that supports it like a lot. So this is also a statistic made by Eileen Lerner uh, in her blog about, I think she looked at 8,000 resumes in her um, career as a tech recruiter and the frequency of errors and typos was higher correlated with good engineering performance than other factors. And those factors include a bachelor's from Stanford. So that's BS and CS from top school. So the second biggest correlation point was if the person worked at a top company before, like uh, Google, Facebook, or Twitter. So um, if you want to train for interviews and you want to do a Google-style interview or a company that does Google-style interviews, you just look at cracking the coding interview, interview cake, interviewing I.O. So there are like tons and tons of platforms. Um, depending on, I mean, uh, your level right now, I would calculate in like two weeks until two months that you train every evening in order, well, to perform well. For regular companies, well, learn to communicate what you did exactly, what you're proud of in your project and what you contributed, and ask the companies how they will assess you and prepare accordingly. So, like, don't be shy to ask exactly what uh, the company uh, looks for. So, and this is my most, uh, um, I like this part most. So, what many, many candidates miss is to really interview actually the company back, to really find out if it's a good um, place to work at. So there are a couple of questions that you probably have heard of. Uh, it's called the Jewel test. So do you use source control? Can you make a build in one step? Do you make daily builds? Do you have a bug database? Do you fix bugs before you write new code? Do you have an up-to-date schedule? Do you have a specification? Do programmers have quiet working conditions? This is what I check if I go to companies to like talk to them uh, about what they need in hiring. So I look at this a lot, actually, because I 
see that this is one. I mean, I as a programmer, I want to have a quiet place to work. Um, do you use the best tools money can buy? Do you have testers? Do, you, do new candidates write code during the interviews? Do you have hallway usability testing? And um, those, I mean, uh, things you also find on Stack Overflow careers, so they do the same assessment. And um, questions I would also try to ask is if it's possible to see the source code of the company, which might be able, I mean, this would be like something also to show off your code reading skills, right? And also, some companies miss to invite you to go with the guys for a beer and stuff like that. So I would try to politely um, suggest uh, this to get to know the company. So there are bonus questions that are really tricky. And I would ask them if you like, feel uh, sympathy with the hiring manager and the interviewer. So you can ask, what is the most costly tech decision made earlier on that the company is living on right now? And where do product and feature ideas generally come from? So the first question would be more for the technical programmer. And the second question would be more for somebody who is like a product programmer. I mean, this categorization in the beginning is just like a funny, um, well, interesting way to look at um, engineers. So I kind of like to play with that a bit. Um, generally, try not to ask like questions that are super uninteresting about, about like vacation days to the engineers because their time is valuable, and just ask this to HR, please. <laughs> yep. Salary negotiations, probably something that is uh, underestimated um, <laughs> and should get more attention uh, if you get a new job. So try to, there's a couple of points that I like, like to recommend. So don't disclose your current salary if HR asks for it. So because, I mean, essentially, this can be a benchmark against you, right? Um, and postpone the discussion about money as long as you can because, well, it's a benchmark. And if HR insists, then tell them you feel uncomfortable because you want to find out how you can benefit the company. And based on that, you can give a number. So I'm a fan of postponing that as much as uh, possible. Um, and if it's like absolutely not possible, which might be the case for bigger companies, then tell them, okay, I want it to not be a benchmark. And hopefully it's fine then. So if you like had the um, uh, luck to get through the, through, the, through the whole process, and now this important moment where salary comes, and they suggest your number, then in my experience, it's a dominant strategy if you try to just be silent. Because the other person, out of social awkwardness, will maybe continue talking. <laughs> there is a <laughs> blog post about how somebody made 15K more just by not jumping up and down after getting actually an offer that was like on the upper scale of what uh, she expected. So no matter what number you get, it's a business relationship. And in the end, you sell your time and you get the salary. So for them, you're a resource in a way. And 5K more or less for a company that already went through the very painful process interviewing you, in the end, for them, it's absolutely irrelevant. 5K more or less. But for you, uh, it makes the difference in five years or 10 years if you can buy a house or not. So for you, it's a big deal, and for them, it's not. So don't feel bad to ask for more. So the last uh, thing um, I want to start the discussion with is long-term engineering career paths. So the old and rusty programmer, like it's a thing that the very senior engineering roles at smaller or middle-sized companies, they don't really exist. And people after 50, they don't really have like um, a way to, um, well, become better in their career unless they go to management. So this is something that bigger companies really solved. Um, and this is something I tried to do research about. 
at gitrecruit.io, um, where I try to match companies with candidates. And if you have other ideas on recruiting, just say hi at gitrecruit.io. And um, yeah, that's my ideas about recruiting. So. Yeah. So we have a microphone. If you have any ideas that you want to uh, contribute, you can just um, tell me now, or we can also like chat later. Yeah, order. Thank you, Ivan. Oh. So we'll have a discussion. If you have something to share or a question. Uh, hi. Uh, in my experience, and, and maybe this is cultural, if I send an offer to a person without mentioning the, the salary, I get lots of rejections. So maybe this is a, a cultural thing, but here in Spain, companies are used to offer crap money. And if you don't start by giving a, a, a sensible offer, lots of candidates reject the offer. Have you found this? Or is this something from a cultural? That might be actually cultural. So I, I operate mainly in uh, the Germanic part of Europe, so German-speaking countries. and. I think they might be less willing to discuss salaries and like talk about money uh, compared to other cultures. Um, that's, uh, I mean, at bigger places there is also more like, um, for instance, Zurich is very small, and the variance and like standard, like standard deviation around them. So you have a mean salary and you have like a standard deviation, and in Zurich it's like super high. So for instance, I met senior engineers who make like 130k. And like same qualified people who make like 70 at smaller companies because they are like low balled and the, like, the city is small and therefore you have not like a standard number in New York or London you do have that so there is like less variance and there it might be more common also to 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 ask for this because then they want to check if you're like aware of the market or not whereas in Zurich or smaller cities. It's like there is no actual number, so it's much more dependent on the company and um, other factors. But yeah, it's cultural, I believe. Thanks for your talk. It was quite interesting to see the other side. Uh, so, uh, in particularly, I liked when you mentioned that uh, HR people spend like less than a minute typically on reading a CV. Oh yeah, maybe like less than 30 seconds. <laughs> maybe less than 30 seconds. So I'm it's sorry actually for that. <laughs> quite, quite a similar case on our side. I guess developers spend like 20 seconds reading the recruitment mails because they all look the same. <laughs> so then uh, there's obviously a question, who should read those? Because uh, <laughs> developers don't get money for that and HR people do. So uh, the next question actually is, uh, if the HR people who do not read the CV carefully and still get money for that, do not, are incapable of uh, getting those keywords out of the CV. Is it actually a good sign that they didn't reply to you, which means that it's probably a bad company and you wouldn't probably apply there anyway? Or you think that there could be bad HR people representing actually a good company? With your experience, is there a correlation between quality of reading out the CV and quality of the company? Um, probably there is a correlation. I mean, if you're good in one thing, you're good at like other things. So this is actually a life question I'm asking myself because on the other hand, you have the saying, okay, people who are good at one thing, they are generally good at other things. But then the, also there is like this halo effect. So you shouldn't judge somebody because he's good at running that he's also good at like, I don't know, like, like other things. So, or like, so, so this is like a, a research thing I think about uh, a lot actually. So I can't really answer that. So one thing to, to see here is that yeah. one thing to remember here is that everyone who works for a company has passed through HR first. So uh, the way HR works actually determines who's working for a company. And so uh, if you don't get along with HR, you may not actually fit into that company because everyone else did. Oh, yeah, but. Mm. Well, I mean, but if a company is small, there is no HR, and HR comes in later. 
And I have like an example in Zurich, great company. They just hire, uh, hired a internal recruiter. And this guy would turn down, like I recommended them a guy who worked at Mozilla. And like he would turn him down. And I was like rather pissed because like, I mean, this HR guy is like a new hire and I'm very sure that this is a fit. And he's like, oh, whatever, Mozilla. Yeah, so, I mean, um, uh, HR is definitely, s and, well, anybody who is not able to write or read code is bad at assessing engineers. So what I think, I'm even planning to do like a workshop for HR people to learn about like computer science, JavaScript, uh, Python, and it would be like, I think, a two to three day course and um, it might be successful. Actually, like th this kind of training, who would attend this? Like good HR people, right? So I believe um, you need some kind of training to assess engineers, um, yeah. And actually like HR, I mean, in more traditional companies, they think in a way that at other uh, jobs, there is really true that the engineers have to like back, uh, the, the candidates have to back to get the job. But in our domain, engineering, it's the other way around. Like companies have to back to get engineers. And many HR people don't get this. Hi. Um, first, thanks for this talk. I'm here. Uh, hi. <laughs> um, and from my uh, experience, I can confirm that many of the things that you recommended work. I also recommend um, sending out some test assignments before even looking at CVs. So that's what we do, for instance. Like we receive applications, but we first ha actually see some work of the person before checking with the CV. But that's not the point I wanted to make. Um, the point I wanted to make is one way to suck at uh, IT recruiting is to be exclusive, to only talk to a certain type of engineer. And uh, I'm, t of course, talking about diversity, which is a very broad topic. It's uh, about gender, it's about uh, orientation, it's about being big, small, it's about race, it's about many things. And um, one of the tricky things about uh, those very successful ways of recruiting for IT is referrals, for instance. So if you get to your employees to refer their friends and their former mates, well, they will probably recommend similar people to them, so you will lack in diversity. And also, if you go for beers, beers with candidates, or the guys are going <laughs> for beer with the, with the candidates, you also like missing out on opportunities to meet informally some candidates from other backgrounds who don't drink alcohol for many reasons. Could be health, could be religion, could be pregnancy or whatever. Um, so do you have any tricks uh, to um, solve these type of issues? So what we try is to have informal time for meeting candidates during the day where people are coming to the office. So that's the lunch, that's the coffee break, something like this, but maybe you have some other ideas in your experience. Um, yeah, so there are like uh, a big tendency towards all you said. So to hire only like, uh, you know, university graduates from the school and be like very in one direction. That's very bad and inefficient. So my dream as a tech recruiter is to help to make the market more efficient. So to make it perfect. So everybody finds a job that he or she likes. And this is a very important aspect you should focus on. And like people who are not fitting your profile in order to look at all available um, candidates. Uh, so I totally support what you just said. Yeah. Hi. So thanks again for, for the talk. It was great. Um, so I have two questions. One is uh, regarding the, your suggestion that uh, when we get a, an offer, we should uh, shut up. Um, so does that apply also for, for emails? I mean, we, we should wait, or how, how does it work? <laughs> Sometimes the offer comes in an email. What's that? Say again? So yeah. The offer comes in an email. Yeah, so what, what do we do? Um, so you don't, I mean, the social, so, like, you, you, you are quiet because you exploit, like, social uh, norms. If you don't reply to an email, I'm not sure if this also applies. Um, you could, for instance, call back 
like rather rather quickly and uh, say that you 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 are not sure about this and that point if she if she or he can repeat the aspects of the offer and then you again have the situation where you can let the other person know that you are like happy but not too happy okay so in general it's better to negotiate this in person that's your advice mm -hmm. okay. and i have another thing that i learned doing this business is that if people don't reply your emails that doesn't mean that they are not interested so i like it happens so often um i'm hiring also for startups so there was like one founder um that uh, just recently we talked and he was like, yeah, great. Yeah, you're a great recruiter. We want to work with you because you're a software engineer, blah, blah, blah. Send me an email. And then I'll send him an email. Hey, it was great chatting to you. It was super cool. I have uh, this and this uh, terms and conditions. Let's work together. Silence. Like for a week. So I write again. Hey, how are you? I just wanted to let... Uh, to, to ask if you received my email and we can continue further talking about um, this uh, cooperation that we uh, talked about last week. Silence. And <laughs> I have one example where I did this for 32 times. <laughs> and the 33rd time, it was like, hey, Ivan, I... So I'm really sorry that I couldn't answer. I had to launch this rocket ship and stuff like this happened here and there. And I'm so happy that you got back to me. Let's meet for dinner. <laughs> so, so it's really important. So like when people tell me I'm not interested, I stop mailing. But you have to uh, keep up the email conversation because people have other things to do. And you're in, like not the most important thing in their lives usually. So um, this is probably one of the biggest learnings uh, doing this. Can I? <laughs> What's that? Could you please repeat that speech that I got in time for a passage to become like a free plan? I'm launching rocket. Could you please come back to the later and my feedback? Yeah. Uh, hi. So <clears throat> I'm guessing you might be a, a bit biased. But uh, when for somebody seeking a job, would you suggest going through a recruiter if, if as, opposed to, as opposed to job offerings given directly by the companies? And my motivation for that is that so far my experience with recruiters was, was a bit dreadful. They were very uh, aggressive and I kind of felt like I'm in a, in a blockbuster for a movie just with me being the, the main character. And that kind of felt kind of weird and I've had most much better... Uh, is it okay to perceive the recruiter as the end, as somebody who is working for that company is, is trying to get my salary lower, as, as opposed? I, are you talking about like external recruiters, third party? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So like I'm, I think about to get recruit out of my project name because of this. <laughs> because the word recruit or recruiter has such a negative connotation that uh, has a reason uh, that, well, companies are or recruiting companies are usually pretty bad. The whole sphere has a bad connotation because people do keyword matching, not respectful, uh, well, towards the engineers. Um, so uh, I would suggest working with a recruiter if you like to know the market rates, um, which companies are good in, let's say, a new city, uh, and like detailed information about the market. Then it could make sense to work with a recruiter. But then again, there is a big variance in quality. So I try to be like on the top uh, level in quality in what I do. So I also don't work like with not so good companies. I always, only work with companies that I myself as an engineer would work at. So uh, you have to decide for yourself. So if you want to move to another city and you want to know the market rates, it might not hurt to uh, 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 exploit uh, the recruiters to, know, to, to get to know the market rates for salary and stuff. Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, I just had a question uh, about, uh, well, as a team, we interview people sometimes. And, well, uh, what are the good 
coding questions to to ask well it's a bit wide but uh, well uh, I, I read something about uh, well uh, classical things like uh, Fibonacci etc were not necessarily good and well, it was quite uh, an open question, but uh, are there some things that are that you see mm, more um, more uh, how, uh, um, per pertinent? Uh, well, it's a so how to add, like what are good questions for interviews? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like the one part um, that always works is. To, to ask about projects the person did. So this is even a question, I like the questions most that are not getting easier when you know them. And those are questions like, if you can talk about a project that you did in the past, and if, if you're familiar with the technology stack, you can like, dive deeper like in, a, in an area, and you see how much deep you can go uh, with what you're asking. And um, this is a way that always works. Yeah, theoretical questions, not Maybe not, then. Yeah, those Google questions are good for Google um, and other like companies that can afford to ask them. I mean, yeah. Uh, it's also a good communication opener to, to open the, the interview with a question about uh, projects that the um, interviewee has, has done before, so they have something to comfortably talk about, in a way. Exactly, yes, absolutely. Hi, uh, there is an uh, area we not cover here, and I was I want to ask, the, can you share some tips how to find a good freelancer? <laughs> how to find a good freelancer? He's here. <laughs> <laughs> Wear a T-shirt that says "I'm looking for." No, I don't. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, there are different platforms on the internet. Um, I think the most important part is for freelancers to build trust as fast as you can. So, for instance, if I need support with some engineering, I always go like on Upwork on, or similar platforms, and I look only for people from Ukraine, because then I can say, "Hey, I've been born in Kiev." Blah 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 blah, blah about the thing, like about our like. Uh, common heritage. And then there is some sort of trust. And the per like this is a little thing that I do. Do we have any other questions? Two, three. You? How much time do we have left? Five minutes. OK, so then we make like one, two, three. But the lady was first, actually. From, I think you, don't you work for Hired.com? Okay. This is not a pitch for Hired at all. Um, although I do recommend that you all go to it, but we're only in London, Paris, and Berlin. So if you're not looking to go there, then don't worry about it. Um, so I, my experience mostly comes from the US. I only moved to Europe about a year ago, but oh, I wanted to can. answer. Hmm? Um, sorry, I'll talk louder. Um, I wanted to answer your question about external recruiters. Uh, one of the problems with why they're so aggressive and horrible is because most of the time they don't actually get a salary. Um, their salary comes entirely from commission based on when they place you. So they're going to be as aggressive as they can to get you to accept an offer and to get you to accept an offer with the highest salary you can possibly get because that increases their livelihood, of course. If they don't make a single placement in a year, they don't make any money that year, which really sucks. Um, I also want to say thank you for the presentation and that if you all are very interested in the data behind recruiting, he had mentioned Aline Lerner's blog. She is a phenomenal engineer. She has about 10 years of Python data science background and her blog is all about that in ways, the best practices when it comes to actually sourcing those emails and sourcing from LinkedIn. If you don't want to use any external platforms, it's really fantastic. Um, and my last question to you, sorry, really quickly, was what's the most creative interview process that you've ever seen? Um, because a lot of the times when a startup does interview, these one-on-one -on -one interview processes I've noticed just don't work out quite well. Um, it's very intimidating for the individual. And if you don't know the runtime of a specific algorithm, like you shouldn't have to know that on the spot. Whereas some people like Google really do think that that's important. Um, so have you seen any that are particularly outstanding that really get to the, you know, programming techniques of the startup itself. 
Do you mean, um, I'm not sure like uh, about uh, the process, but the way people were hired. So one, my absolutely favorite story is like a US um, kid. Uh, he's actually on this conference and uh, not in this room. So he was essentially um, uh, dreaming of becoming a software engineer until he was 12. And he, like he became homeless when he was 14. So like really, really poor growing up in uh, Illinois and uh, really living on the streets until he was 23. And then he started to work as a mechanic, like a mechanic, and then looked at TV, in, in TV that, well, software engineers actually make decent money. And then he found a C++ book in a thrift store for $1.50. And every night after doing his mechanics job, he did this C++ book where everything was like, this code is deprecated, this code is deprecated, because the book was so old. <laughs> and, uh, and then he somehow uh, uh, ended up on a conference where he made a German company. And this German company, like seven months later, they hired him like right away after he had like enough experience in uh, Python and Django. So this is like, <laughs> like uh, this goes back to what you said, like exceptional candidates that are exceptional in their own way, like being homeless and stuff. This experience is like maybe um, something special. So there are two more questions over here in front, right? Hi, I have two questions. Uh, first, is the GitHub search available online, or do you have it just locally? So the API can be can be crawled. Oh yeah, but uh, about the website, is it available online, or the, the hackathon website that you've built? They will not search. Ah, this one. Yeah. No, it's local host. Okay. And the second, the second question I have is. Uh, is about actually your website. You mentioned that Git recruit services and trainings you receive are free, but we take 20% of each revenue that you make with our support. So what does that mean? <laughs> oh, OK. So, so what, what I try to build is, um, so Git recruit should become a tool to enable us to find engineers. But I want to have like partners in each city that use, use uh, the Git recruit tool. So for instance, this tool and other tools we build, like a CRM and a applicant tracking system that you can use for free. So this is what I'm building with a friend. And then the person who does the recruiting in Bilbao, in Milan, in Munich, he, he gets all this training and the software for free. And then um, Git Recruit headquarters get a cut, gets a cut of this. I'm not sure how much the cut is or stuff like that. Um, so this guy already like looked on the website, and this was a very specific answer. So sorry for the rest of you. Um, is there any questions? So no more questions? Thank you, Ivan, and uh, thank you, everybody, for your interest.